And for the second time ever, we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reviewing Network Live. Uh, as you can tell, I am still, I am still sick. My voice sounds a little bit different. Uh, my nose is still a little bit stuffy. Uh, I don't have the sore, th sore throat, and the coughing is very limited now compared to what it was a couple of days ago. And um, I gotta say, man, the last week has been very, very. It's been an interesting week. Uh, not for the better. I mean, uh, a lot of things happened this past week that, um, um, we'll get into that. We'll get into all that in just a little bit. Uh, we'll also tackle, uh, the weekend box office. I have a couple of news stories that th I thought were interesting that I might want to, that I wanted to cover on here. I also have a couple of streaming recommendations since some new stuff came out this week. We are in September, of course. We are in fall. That means that the new fall shows, the new fall movies are coming out. And, uh, I have a couple of recommendations for you. So, I'm going to try my best to do my normal thing here. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this for the first time, uh, first off, this is not how my voice usually sounds, but um, but I digress. This is a weekly stream of consciousness conversation where I sit down with you. I sit down with you, have a couple of drinks, um, have a snack or two, and I will be here for at least an hour, maybe even more this particular week because there's so much I want to cover here, but... Um, we're basically going to have a freeform conversation recording session talking about the stuff that's happened in the past week, and these are long form these are long form conversations, which basically means that we're going to be here for a while, and there's going to be mostly unedited with some occasional foul language every once in a while. Nothing too bad per se, but um, if you're offended by it, I would advise you to please, of course, step aw step away. Or if you are up to the challenge, uh, welcome aboard, and. Um, Let's get going, because we have a lot to get to here, so let's begin the conversation. So before we get into the weekend box office, I kind of want to explain what's been going on the last week. Um, as you can tell, I am sick. I have a common cold. It's not, not COVID. I know it's not COVID, because I know what COVID felt like, but um, it's not COVID. I, I know that there's a resurgence of COVID going on, a little a little resurgence at this, as of the time of recording this, but... Um, but uh, so yeah, this is just a common cold, but... Um, uh, it started on Tuesday night. I didn't notice it until Wednesday. And Wednesday, when I put the video up on the main channel talking about the the NFL predictions, which uh, we'll get to those in just a little bit because um, uh, that's another subject we can get into altogether. But um, it, it started on Wednesday. Thursday, I noticed that I was definitely not feeling well. I was coughing. My throat was sore. Um, I had a fever. But by Thursday night... It really wasn't. I didn't feel anything. To I didn't feel, it. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But like I still had the fever. I still had the sore throat. I still had the cough. But I was taking some chloroseptic, and I also took some uh, contour cold and flu medicine, which is the, which uh, of course is cold and flu medicine. But but um, but then Friday came around, and when I woke up on Friday, everything looked was kind of normal. I was still kind of like in the same place I was on Thursday. I still had the fever. Still had the sore throat. Still had the cough cough and then I went to and then I went to work I went to work um, mostly I was going to work mostly to see mostly because I felt like I was more than capable enough to do my job which I was able to do and um, when I went in there on Friday afternoon everything was fine I mean I could see is everything was going good and then about an hour into my shift on Friday my eyes started to get all like foggy like I don't know what was going on on, but like throughout much of the rest of the evening and for the day and throughout much of the rest of the evening, my eyes were like really, really foggy. Like I really had no idea what was going on. I mean, I was, I was, I was pertained to what was going on. I knew where everything was. I didn't bump into anything. I didn't crash anything. Like I wasn't bump I wasn't like getting into any things that would have made me un unable to work, but it was a weird situation. I was what I couldn't figure out what was going on at that point. I don't know what it was. I think it. I think what happened was when I got to is when I got home. I put it together that maybe I took a little bit too much of the recommendations for the cop medicine, even though I took. Because here's the thing with the contact cold and flu medicine: you have to take it. Is it says on there? Take four. Take two caplets every four hours, but don't exceed four caplets. Was it two caplets every four hours, or was it... Now I'm confused for a second. Okay, I'd look at it again. It's two caplets every six hours, but then they say, don't take eight caplets over 24 hours, because that's where it tells you the side effects that you might have if you take it more than the recommended dosage. 
So I was taking two capsules every six hours. Like I did that on Thursday and then on Friday. And I still got the glassy eyes. Like I did. I don't know what was going on. I don't know if the, I don't know if there was something wrong with that particular medicine I was using or what. But uh, it was um, it was very very weird. But as I said before, it didn't affect me doing my job. I still was able to do my job at work. And but it was, but it was hard to see at times. Like I could see, but it was like it was like really really foggy. But I mean, I really thought something seriously had gone wrong with me. But um. But, um, no, after I got, so I got off work, went home, went home, took a shower, and then I went to bed early. Like, I don't go to bed, I don't go to bed at, at normal times that most people do, because I have the site and everything, and I, everything I have to do for the site and the channel, so I'm usually up till like, 3, 3.30 in the morning. I went to bed at 1 a.m., and, um, yeah, I went to bed at 1, and, um, when I woke up, everything was fine. Like, my eyes were, were fine. I don't know if it was just drowsiness or what, but um, it was a weird, weird circumstance. And I, want, and I basically, I held it together. I went to work for the week mostly to try to, is I thought, because my thinking was, if I can make it to work, if I can make it through work all this week, then there should be no reason for me to not go to the pit football game on Saturday, which that was a whole other story altogether. And uh, why don't we go ahead and delve into Saturday then? So Saturday rolls around and... Um, I should also point out that I got I kind of got my dad sick too, and he was supposed to he's supposed to go with me. Is he went with me to the game along with our, a friend of ours? And um, when he got sick, I thought on Saturday morning I really didn't know if I was going to be able to go because of what was going uh, with me and him. I didn't know if that was going to be any problems or anything. But um, we went to the game on Saturday, and it started off like normal, like we, like he. Like he and I were, you know, I had the same kind of symptoms. Except I think he had more. I think he had more because he's a di he's a diabetic, so uh, that's going to play into something that happens later on in the evening. So we went out. So we went to the Rivers Casino because that's where we go to when we go to these games to, for parking. Uh, we go there four hours before the game because if you go there four hours before the game, you don't have to pay for parking. If you go there for, within four hours of the game, it's eighty dollars to park there, which is completely ridiculous. But that's how the, I mean, when the casino's literally right next to the stadium, I guess that's how you gotta make the extra money, but, um, so we're there for a couple of hours, and then we went to the game, we watched the game, and you saw the video over on the other channel, and then everything was about what it usually was when we go to these games, but then the third quarter started happening, and then so I began to notice something was off with my dad, dad because like I said he was sick but I think he has more, I think he had more, he was still he got it from me so he was getting he was a day I think a couple days behind where I was at so in terms of how beat sick I was but so by the end of the third quarter I had a call from him because he went up to go to the bathroom up at the up in the lobby or the uh the um where all the concessions are at but um so he gets he calls me and tells me Come meet me up there when the game is over. And I said, what are you talking about? He thought the game was over at the third quarter. And um, I should have known something then was wrong. But then once the game actually ended and we finally got out of there, me and my dad's friend uh, started realizing that my dad was walking very erratically, very off. And he didn't really notice it until well after well after the fact that he started doing this like we he was like really moving around like he doesn't drink i don't drink in my family is i don't think anybody in my family really drinks except for maybe my sister but um but we don't drink my i know my dad doesn't drink or so him moving around like that that was um it got pretty scary it did get pretty scary at one point at a lot actually a lot of points because with you know you know, it's not that big of a walk from the stadium to the casino, but when you're sick, um, it didn't bother me because I was getting better, but him still a couple days behind where I was at, it got scary. It did get scary, but we were able to bring him into the casino. It's funny when the security guards, because they have the security guards in front of the casino, when we went in there, one of the security guards stopped us and said, is he intoxicated? And we told him, no, he's not intoxicated. But um, like I said, he's a diabetic. And he, what ended up happening was a combination, it was a combination of a couple of things. One, being sick. Two, being out there in the weather. But it wasn't 
bad weather either. In fact, I was expecting a lot worse. They said it was supposed to rain on Saturday, but it didn't. But um, it was still kind of muggy out there. So, but on th but third, he didn't eat a whole lot. He got a is we got burgers from um, this burger place inside the casino, and uh, I had a burger. He had half of a uh, half of a burger, and. Um, so he didn't eat that much, and he and he's also been taking cold medicine too, which is like adding into all this thing. So what they did was that they put him in a wheelchair. We all went back behind the casino, and uh, one of the people there did a did a um, what do you call it? A is it a glaucoma test or a blood sugar test? Is what I'm thinking of. So they tested his blood sugar, and um, it was normal. So there wasn't any big problems there. I just think he didn't eat and. And it was also because of the weather too. Because once we once we got everything settled out out of there, we went out of the casino. We basically went into the car. We had to wait because all the traffic was going around the parking lot. And after a few, after a little bit of getting into the, as I'm sitting there, letting the cool air take over, he was coming around again. So it wasn't so. I'm grateful the night didn't end with us in the hospital because I really thought to myself that that was going to happen. And um, it was scary, and honestly, we really shouldn't have gone to the game because on because of that alone. But and again, the game didn't end up being exci all that great either. Like, but um, but like I said, uh, nothing bad happened. Like I said last night, nothing bad happened. Nothing too. Cr we didn't go to the hospital. Uh, he made it home. He's been as he's been um, lying down most of, all day long because that's what they told him to do. You say go home. Take your medicine, get something to eat, and just lie down. Just don't do anything str straining on you. And uh, that's what he's been doing all day long. So nothing bad. So my dad's okay. I'm okay. Everything's fine. It was scary. It was scary there, but it did really make me. I was worried. I was definitely worried that uh, is that something bad was going to happen. And I don't know. I, and like I said before, we really shouldn't have gone to the game, but my dad said, uh, my dad basically said that I w is he went because I wanted to go, and you know he w if he had said if he had said at some point that you know I'm not feeling well, do you know you mind if we don't go to the game? I would have been fine with that, but he never said anything, and we and he already made plans on Saturday morning. I didn't even know on Sat yesterday morning if I was actually going to go to the game or not, but um, but uh, we did, and then that happened, and um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, like I said. Everything's fine, you know, we're still recovering from these colds. Um, I guess this is the time of year that we get, this, my family gets this. This and May are usually like the rough, rough times to get this. So so hopefully this will be something that will be over and done with and over the next couple of days. So, uh, but um, that's just a, it's just been a culmination of a really, really rough week. Uh, not only because of the, those personal things, but just like, all the excitement that they we had all this weekend, the you know pick coming having Cincinnati come to town and then Cincinnati just just dismantling them and then having to experience that today with pretty much the same thing that happened yesterday with Pitt, with the Panthers happened with the Steelers. It's just like San Francisco just came in, they took over uh, not just the, the team but the fans all over Acrisure Stadium. They all came, is they all took over and it was just. Everything went bad from there. It's just like all that high hope everybody had, including myself, just like <clears throat> down the crapper. It's just like like this team is literally going to be zero and six by the time we, they get back, they get back. They're done with the Rams. Like this is this is not looking good for the Steelers this year. Like Matt can't like Kenny Pickett looked horrible today. The, like he like I don't know what happened. Like the defense looked terrible. But, like, they just let San Francisco come in and just dismantle everything that was building up for this team. And just, like, it's just, it's just, it's just the culmination of a really, really rough week is what I'm trying to say here. But, um, but, uh, yeah, but, um, uh, you know, we've been, we've been all kind of negative so far today, but let's get to some positive stuff for a change, you know? I got things. I got some personal stuff out of the way. Just, I'm in a kind of a sour mood, especially after what happened today with the Steelers. But, um, but uh, let's try to get back on a positive note here. Let's get to the actual show itself. I uh, just wanted to vent a little bit, but um, let's get to the stuff you want to re really want to get into here. Let's talk about the weekend box office. 
And not a lot of big surprises of the weekend box office, quite honestly. Uh, one of the movies that's been there for a while now finally dropped out. But uh, a movie that's been still dominant in there for the last eight weeks is still in there. And that's the number five movie. And that is Barbie, which dropped down three notches because there were three new releases in the top five this weekend. Uh, Barbie still made $5.9 million, 42% drop off from last week, $620 million uh, here, here in America alone. And then you add in the international grosses, $1.4 billion. Nobody's really complaining at this point. I think this is actually coming out on digital this week, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to double check on that. But um, let's get to the new releases because there's a couple of new releases that we already knew were coming out. And then this one just came out of nowhere. Um, the number four movie, and that is Jawan, which is uh, produced by Yash Rash Film USA. And I th think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the same company that put out RRR. Is it? Uh, maybe not. Yeah, this is not the same company that put out RRR. This is the company that puts out the uh, the spy universe action thrillers like Ek the Tiger, Tigers and Daha, and War, Doom 3, Sultan, uh, Pathon was their highest grossing release. It was uh, one of the releases they had earlier this year, which earned over $130 million in the U is it U.S. money and $10 billion for uh, the... I don't know exactly... Crow is what it's called, um, but um, I've never heard of this movie before, so I don't really know too much about it, but um, these Bollywood movies, man, I mean, these are movies that have, have been getting a lot, a lot of uh, more awareness over the last couple of years, mostly because of stuff like RRR, and um, I've yet to hear anything about this one here, but the reviews for this have been really good. Um, and uh, this thing only opened in 813 theaters and still made over seven mil seven and a half million dollars. Um, you know, six point one, six point two million dollars, seven point five million. You know, not bad, not bad for a movie that did not have a whole lot of publicity on TV. But like, they f found an audience, so good for them. I mean, I don't really else, I don't really know what else to say about it, but good on them for finding an audience. But um. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the number three movie. And the number three movie is, appropriately, a third film of the series, and that is My Big Fat Week Wedding 3, a.k.a. Surpassing the Hangover for the most pointless comedy trilogy of all time. Like, um, I really don't get why they needed to make a trilogy out of this movie. I mean, just, the original My Big Fat Week Wedding was a passable movie. I don't love it like everybody else does, but... What has Nia Vardalos done since then that has been notable? I mean, like I said before, she did that terrible, terrible cross-dressing movie that was trying to be kind of like the Victor Victoria of the 2000s, Connie and Carla, which was um, a film that starred Tony Collette and also had David Duchovny in it, which was, like I said, it was not a good movie. So uh, she had uh, My Life in Ruins, which was this film that tried to be another My Big Frank Week wedding but failed miserably, mostly because they put it out in the summertime. Uh, right in the middle of blockbuster season, so I don't know why, how you're gonna make any money from that. And now you have uh, not only another a third installment of the series that really did not need to continue after the first movie. Like everything after the first movie has been downright terrible. My Big Frack Week Life, the second movie, My Big Frack Week Wedding Three. I, I should take that back. I haven't seen this one, but um, but My Big Frack Week Wedding Two was not that good of a movie. And I really don't know what else you can throw into my big Frank Week wedding at this point that has to require a third film in the series. This is like the book club movies. Like, why is there a book club movies? Why is there an 80 for Brady? Why do these movies based... These, why are these movies that are targeted at older women so lackluster in terms of the comedy, in terms of the way they promote this? They go for the cheapest jokes possible in the trailers. It's just like... Like what is the what is the end result of this? Like what what helps you ever, you by making these movies? I just don't get it whatsoever. That's nothing against Nia Vardalis. I mean, she did a I mean she did a capable job in My Big Fat Week Wedding, but she hasn't done anything of noteworthiness since then. That's the problem. You're sticking on this one thing that has made you popular for over twenty years, and that's all you're doing. It's just like. Branch your talents out, girl. Come on. I mean, just... I mean, I don't know. That's just that's just my thinking on that front. But, um... My Big Fat Week Wedding 3 came out... Of, came out $10 million. Over 3,600 theaters. Like, 
Yes. Why? Why do we put that in the... Why do we put this movie in that many theaters for? Like, really? But, um... Yeah, $10 million. Not really a whole lot there to celebrate about that one. But, um... But, uh... Let's go ahead and t go to number two. The number two movie, which was the number one film last week, which was, um... The Equalizer 3, which... I should have expected this to have a, a big drop-off. 65%, uh, considering what happened the last weekend. Uh, $12.1 million, $12 million, $61.9 million after two weeks. Uh, comparing this to the other Equalizer films, uh, right now it's about $3 million below the original Equalizer second weekend, which was $18.7 million, but the total gross for the second weekend, after the second week, was $64.2 million. It's also below the original, the second Equalizer movie at $64.2 million. Um, so, uh, it's definitely down from the other two films, but, I mean, I, I mean, it's not off by that much. I mean, $61.8 million, $61 million is not bad for this movie. I think the budget on this movie, it could be that high. I would be shocked if it's more than some of these $100 million movies that we've gotten over the last, no, $70 million. So, it'll be, it's gonna do fine, no matter what, at this point. Uh, it's definitely right in the same place that it was with the last two movies, so it's gonna be it's gonna make its money back, no problem whatsoever. So uh, that's the number two film. Now let's go ahead and get to the number one film, which I should which I really should have seen this coming, but um, for some reason I thought the Equalizer three might have had a good stronger hold, considering the good word of mouth it got. But um, um, nothing, nothing but nothing mean nothing. Sorry for that terrible pod, but it, The Nun 2 is the number one movie this week. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show you the power of the Conjuring universe. I mean, you know, Warner Brothers was trying to make the DC Cinematic Universe the equivalent to the MCU, but you already have something that's just as successful as the MCU in the Conjuring universe. I mean, think about it. Three Conjuring movies, three Annabelle movies, uh, Curse of La Lorna, which was eventually brought into that series... And two nun movies. I mean, you have a good slate of films. Most of those movies are solid films, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, the first Annabelle movie was not that great, nor there was the first nun movie. Of course, I haven't seen the nun too, so I can't really say if it's any good or not. But um, I actually don't know how good the Warner Mouth is on the on the nun too. I haven't heard a lot of people really say anything that spectacular about it. But uh, let's see here. What do we got? About where the, about where I thought it was going to be at around forty five percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so not the best, but certainly not the worst, especially when you consider that most horror movies usually don't do that good critically. But um, it had better reviews than the first Nun movie, so I guess they're and it had a better cinema score, so I guess they're moving in the right direction. But um, you know, Annabelle when that when they moved over to the second film and beyond, like that's where that series really began to take off. It actually meant something, so. Maybe they're on to something with the Nun movies. Maybe the next one will be the one that finally breaks them all. But, you know, all these movies in the series have been really, really good. Like, they, most of them have been really enjoyable. They're legitimately good horror movies. The atmospheric tone is great. The visual look of the film are not, is nicely done. Like, there's moments that you'll still remember for many years to come. But, but yeah, it's amazing what the Conjuring films have been able to do. Like, that's the thing that Warner Brothers should be putting its focus on more than the DC Cinematic Universe. But, um... Uh, 32.6 mil million dollars, which is actually lower than the first movie made on its opening weekend. Uh, the first movie, I think, made about 53.8 million dollars, which was actually at that point the best opening of the Conjuring series as a whole. But um, it's le it's less now compared to what this film is. 32.6 million dollars, which is not a bad thing, especially with the budget on this, which I do not think the film has. Again, this film should not have a huge budget. Yeah, it's already back. It's already gonna make its money back. Thirty-eight point five million dollars. Everything it's profit from this point on with this particular film. Um, uh, not much more to say about it because I have not seen it. But um, so that's the contra So the Nun Two, the number one movie this week, will probably get bumped out next week for a Haunting in Venice, which I think is the only real big wide release coming out this next weekend. I know Dumb Money comes out this weekend, but it's a limited release before it eventually will go wide at the end of the month. So, um, Hercule Poirot gets the weekend all to himself next week, so we'll see. More than likely, it's going to be the number one movie, but, but it's going to be interesting to see where it actually pans out when it's all said and done. Um, yeah, I think that, like I said, Haunting in Venice, I think, is the only new release coming up next weekend. Uh, 
Early Word of Mouth on it is really good. The reviews started coming out yesterday for it. And I, th it's at 86% right now, which I think is actually the highest of the Kenneth Branagh Hercule Perot movies. And they've been really, a lot of these have been really good movies. Um, definitely not, I don't think was received too well. 62%, which isn't that bad. And Murder on the Orient Express at 61%. Actually, that Haunting in Venice right now is actually at the highest peak of the of the three, according to Rotten Tomatoes. But um, that's actually going to lead into one of the first stories I have to cover because. You can't always trust what Rotten Tomatoes tells you, and, um, you know, let's get into some story time. Why don't we go ahead and do that? So I've been saying for a while now that Rotten Tomatoes has been pretty shady, and this is usually not the place you really want to depend on your is an overall look into you, what, what, what critics like and what critics don't like. And uh, I've said this for the last couple of weeks now, that you don't really want to trust Rotten Tomatoes, even though I'd probably quote the is source them more and more every single week on the, in terms of how good these movies do. But um, I've been saying for a couple of years, for not even a couple of years, just for the past couple of months now, that something shady is going on at Rotten Tomatoes. I don't think is you can't trust the stu a place where you're supposed to be all these critical reviews, but the company is owned by two major movie studios, Universal and Warner Brothers, with Warner Brothers holding a 75% interest in the company, and Universal, I think, holding 25%, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what ex exactly what it was. Let's see here. Oh, it's the other way around. Okay, Warner Brothers owns 25%, NBC Universal owns 75%. Okay. Still, though, like, you can't really trust a company that is owned by two major studios. And uh, a story broke today, not, not even today, this week on Vulture, uh, basically an expose talking about how Rotten Tomatoes basically paid off critics, to, is being paid, is accused of paying off critics. Um, so the story basically goes here, it's a, I'm on Vulture, the, web, the story is called The Decomposition the of Rotten Tomatoes, the most overrated metric in movies is erratic, redu reductive, and easily hacked, and yet has Hollywood in its grip, which is very much true. But um, So basically what happened was, in 2018, there was a movie publicity company called Bunker 15 that took out a new project called Ophelia, which is a feminist retelling of Hamlet starring Daisy Ridley. Critics who had seen early screenings had published 13 reviews, seven of them were negative, translating to a 46% on the... Rotten Tomatoes website, which is a disappointing outcome. But just because the tomato meter says that the title is rotten, it doesn't need to stay that way. So Bunker 15 went to work. Um, while most film PR companies aim to get the attention of critics from top publications, they went to a more bo bottom-up approach, recruiting obscure, often self-published critics who are nevertheless part of the pool tracked by Rotten Tomatoes. And in another break from standard practices, several critics say Bunker 15 paid them $50 or more for each review. So basically, uh, these payments are not typically disclosed, and Rotten Tomatoes says it prohibits reviewing based on a financial incentive. And then in October of that year, uh, an employee of the company emailed a, pros a prospective review about Ophelia saying, it's a Sundance film, and the feeling is that it's been treated harshly by critics, so that teams involved feel like it would benefit from more input from different critics. So it's basically not a very subtle code. And that critic wrote back to ask what would happen if he hated the film. So basically, the employee at this at Bunker 15 said, "Of course, journalists are free to write whatever they like, but that not that that." And I quote: "Super nice ones, and there are more critics that like this than I expected. Like this than I expected. Often agree not to publish bad reviews on their usual websites, but to instead quarantine them on a smaller blog that Rotten Tomatoes never sees. I think it's a very cool thing to do." End quote. And if done right, that trick would help to ensure that Rotten Tomatoes logs positive reviews, but not negative ones. So yeah, that's how they do it. I mean, this is a smaller company that did this, but who's to say that major studios have not been doing this for years now? I mean, this basically just says straight out that this system is something that that studios do for have to have done for a living. I mean... I don't want to say I feel vindicated, but uh, I feel like uh, Dr. Cox, whenever he whenever he got JD to come into work on his day off and, and, to, say, and to say, and for um, in celebration of the many, many, the many unnecessary disruptions of your life, uh, here's what, here's uh, Laverne's choir from the, coming in to, is coming in to sing payback as a bitch to you. 
or I think I've gotten I think I've gotten that completely screwed up, but I think that's exactly what the what the quote is. No, I got it right. I got it right. I just had to double check just to make sure. But yeah, I just feel like I just feel like I need to have a choir in the background just go, going "Payback is a bitch, <laughs> Payback is a bitch," because it's just like like you feel a little bit of vindication because something that you think that's been happening for a number of years now. It's, it's basically being brought out into the open, and it's just basically telling you, the, and basically this whole idea of Rotten Tomatoes is not, it's not what it used to be. This is not the thing that it used to be. Like, it's sadly, this is, a, this is unfortunately what Rotten Tomatoes has become. It's become more important for Rotten Tomatoes to give you a fresh review, Is but um, is nowadays in, mo- in mass media than it has it ever been. But you're basically just saying that this whole thing, this whole thing is just like, is this article here does a very good job summoning this whole thing up. I don't know if you're going to be able to read it because it's one of those things where I think you have to pay for it, but I'll just keep going here because it's, it, they make a lot of good points here. It says that, uh, coming up out here, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, turned 25 in August has come to function. Um, the site was conceded in the early days of the web as a hot or not for movies. Now it can make or break them with implications of how films are perceived Release marketed and possibly even greenlit. The tomato meter may be the most important metric in entertainment, yet it's also erratic, reductive, and easily hacked. And uh, Paul Schrader said the studios didn't invent Rotten Tomatoes, and most of them don't like it. But the system is broken. Audiences are dumber. Normal people don't go through reviews like they used to. Rotten Tomatoes is something that the studios can game, and so they do. And considering that I made fun of Paul Schrader for his comments about the Oscars earlier in the year on the other channel, he makes a good point right there because. This is really something that's been going... The problem with film criticism for a number of years. Like, it keeps going on here. Quentin Tarantino's talking about stuff... Talking about Rotten Tomatoes. Like, he admits that he can no longer read critics' work because he basically says, I don't know anyone. You know, he's told that uh, some person, Manola Dargis, she's excellent, but when I ask what are the three movies she loved and the three she hated in the last few years, no one can answer me because they don't care. That's a quote from Tarantino. And it keeps going by saying that this is probably because Rotten Tomatoes has desensitized us to the opinions of individual critics. You know, they talk about how Gene Sisko and Roger Ebert turned the no-budget documentary Hoop Dreams into a phenomenon using only their funds, and more that that should be because Hoop Dreams is a pretty amazing movie. But critical power like that has been replaced by the collective view of the masses. A third of the U.S. audiences say that they check Rotten Tomatoes before they go to the multiplex. While movie ads usually tout the blurbages of Jeffrey Lyons and Peter Travers, now they're more likely to boast a film that's been certified fresh. But to filmmakers across the taste spectrum, Rotten Tomatoes is a score. I think uh, Martin Scorsese said that it reduces the director to a content manufacturer and the viewer to an unadventurous consumer. And Brett Ratner has called it the destruction of our business, but insiders acknowledge that it's become a critical arbiter. Publishers say, publishers say the jobs revolve around the site. So there is so much there to digest here. I think Rotten Tomatoes really, they are me- they are really are a mess of a company. Like they are a company that really, they really are so all over the place. They're so important to the industry, but yet, they have to put. They have to find ways to go behind the scenes to make this stuff, to make these movies that are probably that is that probably should be weighted lower, get higher things. It's just it's just whole combobulated, and I don't think there's a system in place for Rotten Tomatoes right now to fix these. Pro- is to really get a full, simple understanding of how the system works, and that's something that's a problem. I think that's something that really, in a, in the top is in the. Years to come, that's something that's got to be addressed. Like somebody Rotten Tomatoes has to really put together a strategy that shows how the di- has, how their si- system works, who's actually in the system of the reviewers that are putting together the overall consensus for these films. Like, what's the vo- is like? How do you have, you know, how do you have this stuff right here go for go like this for empty like for so long, like? I know I'm just kind of rambling on right now, but this is just something that really, really needs to be addressed pretty quickly. And uh, you can go ahead and look for the we- look for the article yourself. Uh, you should be able to find it on there pretty easily. Uh, you can find it on Vulture. Go ahead and look for that there. But it basically kind of vindicates everything I've been saying about Rotten Tomatoes for a number of years. So, um, so anyway, that's one of the stories I wanted to cover. There was another story about another thing that's shady business going practices going on behind the scenes that happened this week involving one Jimmy Fallon. So Rolling Stone posted the story, I think it was on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. 
about uh, the t the article was called Chaos Comedy in Crime Rooms inside Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show, in which they had 16 current and former staffers say Fallon's erratic behavior spoiled their dreams of working on the Tonight Show, and um, basically the article says that according to two current and 14 former employees, the Tonight Show had been a toxic workplace for a number of years, far outside the boundaries of what's considered normal in the high-pressure world of late-night television. They say the ugly environment behind the scenes starts at, t at the top with Fallon's erratic behavior and has trickled down into every changing leadership teams. You know, nine showrunners in the past nine years, which seemingly does not know how to say no, no to Jimmy, but uh, former employees described the Tonight Show as a tense and pretty glum atmosphere, with some alleging they were belittled and intimidated by their bosses, including Fallon himself. Uh, employees describe it being afraid of Fallon's outbursts and unexpected inconsistent behavior. Most of these staffers voiced their concerns to HR complaints, but problems with the Tonight Show persisted. Um, seven former employees say their mental health was impacted by their alleged experiences working at the Tonight Show. Those staffers say it was commonplace to hear people joking about wanting to kill themselves and that they referred to guests as dressing rooms in the office as crying rooms because that's where they would go to let out their emotions when they were upset about their alleged mistreatment. Uh, the former staffers requested a nominivity out of fear of retaliation. They worked in range of positions on the show from production crew members to office staffers and the show's writing rooms. Many of these former staffers say they left the show because of their mental health and some of them were fired from the Tonight Show themselves. And uh, Well, this show went out to 50 different Tonight Show employees during the reporting of the story. Um, they reached out to an additional 30 of them when they, when they went out to the representatives for Fallon and NBC. Many of them praised Fallon's immersive talent and comedic gifts. Not a single one agreed to speak on the record or had positive things to say about working on The Tonight Show. Nor would any of them pr produce the program's nine show murders since 2014 comment about the program's nick take on the record. That wouldn't even give them statements of support as, a com as is common in the entertainment industry. So basically, it's James Corden all over again. It's Ellen DeGeneres all over again. I mean, you have a big star in late night te in talk show television kind of getting out exposed for being kind of a jerk to people like there's you know there's a whole you know this is something that we're seeing a lot more of in the in the years since then and uh, i think everybody's just been waiting to get to jimmy fallon for because they just don't like him they see him as kind of the equivalent to james corden and except it's, it's weird because like jimmy fallon is seen as kind of the nbc's equivalent to james corden meanwhile seth myers is more equivalent to somebody like CBS or Stephen Colbert. People like Stephen Colbert. People like Seth Meyers. People can't stand Jimmy Fallon or, John, or James Corden. And I mean, they're t is, you can t if you hear these stories over the last couple of years, you can kind of tell wh why. I mean, they have. I mean, Jimmy Fallon, his name is all over the place with this with the Tonight Show. I mean, there's a ride up in Universal Studios with his name on it, which is a great ride, by the way, but. Yeah, you still can't get over the fact that his name is on that ride, and of course he's going to have an ego over himself, and of course he's going to feel crazy about this. And it doesn't help that the guy has a the guy supposedly had a drinking problem back in the early days, and he could be very erratic, he could be very inebriated. Like it just didn't feel like that. Uh, one of the notable things from this article was how uh, two employees talked about when they were in charge of cue cards in the middle of taping with Jerry Seinfeld. They said it was an uncomfortable moment, and Seinfeld had to tell Fallon to apologize to the cue card production members, when he, which he then allegedly did. And it felt awkward to watch. It did not make it into the show. But it says a lot when Jerry Seinfeld has to tell you to apologize to somebody for something that you did. And it's just kind of like... It's just like... It's so weird, and Jerry Seinfeld actually followed up on the statement when Rolling Stone asked him about it, and he said that, This is so stupid. I remember this moment quite well. I teased Jill Mimi about a flub, and we all had a fun laugh about how rarely Jimmy is thrown off. It wasn't comfortable at all, uncomfortable at all, and they still recall it and laugh, and, you know, basically kind of trying to, basically kind of trying to push down that story that somebody said, which, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that's true, and true, but... Usually, when that doesn't automatically put somebody as a bad person, I, at least in my opinion, it doesn't do that. Like I always think back to Chris Berman on Monday Night Football when he got mad at people for moving around during the show, and uh, you never heard anybody really call him a bad person in the years since then. So I don't, I don't know. Like, like honestly, that stuff doesn't really bug me that much. 
I mean, I never hated Jimmy Fallon. I just didn't think he was that good. I didn't think he was that strong of a Tonight Show host. Like, I, I mean, he was the guy that was... Like, he would have gotten the Tonight Show later on down the road, but, of course, because Jay Leno had to have the Tonight Show back so much, and they had to push Conan out some, in some way, shape, or form. Like, that is that led to Jimmy Fallon getting it earlier than him. And, in a way, it worked out in Conan O'Brien's favor, but because he's, he still has more of a lasting legacy than Jimmy Fallon does. Like, I mean... But Jimmy Fallon, ever since he got to Tonight Show, he has been... It's been a struggle to watch his, to watch and see him try to... See him basically try to appeal to everybody, no matter who you are. I always remember the moment when he tried to make Donald Trump a likable person by tossing his hair around. It's just like, see, it makes, me, see, it makes him likable. It's just like, no, no, it really do, doesn't. And, and it's just like, it's just really... like. It's very, very hard to get into this type of stuff here. It's just kind of like it's get it gets ridiculous to. This and he did a apo- and um, he did eventually apologize for this, which basically, basically he said uh, of the he basically apologized for this whole thing. Uh, it was a story that it was something that came out a couple of days after this came out. Let me see if I can find it here. Let me see if I can look for it. Jimmy Fallon apology. Here it is, right here. Um, so he basically said in the thing, uh, it's, a, it's embarrassing and I feel so bad. Sorry if I embarrassed you and your family and friends. I feel so bad, I, I can't even tell you. Um, which basically is the equivalent of saying, I'm sorry I got caught. Like, that's pretty much what I think about whenever I hear somebody try to do something like that. That's just like, it's like... You're say, you're not really that you're not really that sorry. You're sorry that somebody called you out on your bullshit, and basically, you're trying to save your own ass. I mean, that's pretty much what that basically means in my eyes. Whenever somebody tries to say, say, "Oh, I'm sorry," it's just like, and I don't. Re- as, and I was like, "No, you're not." Most of the time, I don't really believe that, except if it's, is like, if it's actually as sincere as they're making it out to be. Like, let me hear Jimmy Fallon say it, in his, say it to his fi- face, to to my face. Like, so, let me let me say. It's not even in my face per se, but let me hear it say it to his face. But then again, I didn't watch the Zoom video, so as far as I know, that may that, that may very well have been the case here. In fact, let me take a break here to actually see if I can find it on here. I thought maybe it'd be on there, but uh, apparently finding that is like finding the Lost City of Atlantis or the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull or whatever it needs that Joe's there is item you want to look for because I can't find it anywhere. But uh, but like I said, man, I mean, he probably was sincere in his apologies, but I don't know. Like, when I hear stuff, when I hear quotes like that, my first thought is that he's doing this to, to do this for damage control. He's doing this to try I had to clear everything up. And, you know, as soon as they get back to work, we're going to start hearing these things again down the road. But um, that's the thing, though. Like, this is coming out when nothing is going on at the Tonight Show because, of, of course, we got the writer strike and the actor strike still going on as of the time of recording this, and we're probably still not going to have anything to the Tonight Show pretty much until the beginning of the new year, because that's what it's sounding like right now. So, um, so basically, my overall thoughts on this is that there probably is some shady work going on behind the scenes of the Tonight Show, but then again, it's been doing that for a number of years now. There was a lot of shady stuff going on during the Jay Leno years, I mean, during the Johnny Carson years, I mean... A lot of shows like this, where you have a big name at the front, have shady business things going on behind the scenes, and you know sometimes you got to get that stuff out there to get is to get it noticed and to, hopefully to get things changed around there. And it's just like this is not really anything too new, but because it is Jimmy Fallon and it is the Tonight Show, the prestigious late night dynasty top, dynasty. I mean, it's a big deal. It's definitely a very big deal. To do, for something like that to happen, so, so uh, that's just kind of my th- th- thoughts on what's going on with the Jimmy Fallon thing. But um, uh, let's get to some of the news coming out of Disney because they had a big, they had a big uh, event happen this weekend where they unveiled some new details about stuff coming to the parks. Uh, let's talk about some of the stuff that happened at Destination D. So Destination D twenty three is an event that takes place in, um, I think it's a, t- I think it takes place within Walt Disney World every is every year opposite to the D23 events, which takes place every two years. But I think the next one they just announced is going to be in August of 2024, if I, if I read it correctly. Either August or September. It's going to be one of those two. But um, this takes this is something that happened during the week of the 
this during this past weekend at the Contemporary Resort at Disney World, and they announced all these different things, um, including their stuff that's going on in the parks, which I'll delve into that first. Uh, they have a rundown here on this on a WDWMagic.com, and so uh, there's a lot of things that they announced, starting with the Animal Kingdom. They are teasing the possibility of an Encanto and Indiana Jones themed experience for the big refurbishment of Animal Kingdom. They say the new experiences inspired by Encanto and the fan fiction, fan favorite adventurer Indiana Jones are being considered for the reimagined land at the Disney at Disney's Animal Kingdom, which includes a potential rebranding of Dinosaur as an Indiana Jones ride. So they have stuff like here like Dino Rama becomes Encanto, the Dinosaur Ride becomes Indiana Jones, Restaurante Source uh, becomes a rethemed area, so with the Dig Site Playground area. And um, uh, could be very interesting to see what they do there. Uh, I don't really under it's like Encanto and Animal Kingdom. I don't think is the I don't think is the right specific placements for book. Is Animal Kingdom? I don't think is a place that Encanto would probably fit in. Like Indiana Jones, I could that I could find some sense into, but Encanto, I don't know. I feel like something like Epcot or maybe even Magic Kingdom probably would be a good place for that, but um, it'd be interesting to see what they bring there. Animal Kingdom is probably the one theme park in Disney that I don't go to a whole lot because there's not really a whole much there. I mean, when they started putting in Pandora, that's the one, that's the one thing I usually go in there for, but it's only even then, it's still like once every couple of years. I don't really like going into Animal Kingdom all that much. I'm just not that type of a person, but... Um, uh, for the Tree of Life Theater there, they're adding a Zootopia show that's going to replace It's Tough to Be a Bug, which has been there for the past 25 years since A Bug's Life came out. So that's going to be something pretty cool to see there. Uh, at Hollywood Studios, they announced that Ashoka from the new Disney Plus, the Disney Plus Star Wars series is going to be heading into Star Tours. And uh, it'll be part of Star Tours starting in the spring at Disney World, Disneyland, and Disneyland Paris. And uh, what this is basically going to do is that... Um, I guess they're just gonna. I guess they're just gonna have the character there. I thought they were gonna add something to the ride itself, but maybe they're just gonna have a character set up there. I could be wrong on that. But um, uh, over at Epcot, they're re they're reimagining Test Track with the inspiration from the original World of Motion, because of course the original uh, Test Track is being rebuilt to have. Um, uh, they replaced at least a piece of concept art of the new experience, which lo which has Test Track being moved into an EV era. era. And uh, the current version of Test Track opened in December of 2012 as part of a sponsorship deal with Chevrolet. And um, there's no plans right now to close the park down. Or not the park, the uh, ride down for now. But um, be very interested to see what they add to that. Because Test Track is a real fun ride. I'm really excited. To see, I'm really curious to see what they'll bring to that. Uh, they have a new Epcot, new nighttime show coming up in December with Luminous. They, they announced that Epcot's Journey of Water inspired by Moana will open on October 16th, and I've seen the stuff for that, and it looks pretty it looks, it looks pretty cool for the little pictures I've seen there. It'll have a Moana meet and greet, among other things. Uh, Figment will begin meeting characters starting this weekend at the Imagination Pavilion. Uh, World Celebration will open in December. It's, part of the, it's the last piece of the multi-year transformation that Epcot's been working on, so that's going to be opening up in December. It's going to be really interesting to see how that turns out. Uh, they're bringing back the original Soaring Over California film on September 22nd, so they're bringing that back on 22nd. It's been something that's been there since... Two, it started there in 2005. They shut it down in 2016 and replaced it with the show that's been there for a couple of years now. Uh, it might be a limited play for the Disney 100 celebration. I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be permanent there, but it's going to be, it would be pretty interesting to see that again. Um, over at the Magic Kingdom, they're finally going to have the Hatbox Ghost at the Haunted Mansion in November after Halloween. Uh, they're going to expand the Pirates of the Caribbean story with a new lounge experience. Uh, beyond Big Thunder Mountain, they're talking about plans of expanding the park over, so that should be something that could be very interesting because, I mean, Magic Kingdom, there's an area in the back there that is clearly something you could do with that area. So it'd be very cool to see what they may bring to the table there. They're talking about stuff like similar scale of stuff like Galaxy's Edge and Pandora. You know, adding new restaurants, attractions, shows, and more. Um, stuff like adding stuff like co based off of things like Coco and Kanto and the villains. Um, you know, a lot of cool stuff they could do with that fit right there. Um, so that's 
That's that. They're adding, they're updating Country Bear Jamboree, and there's going to be a new show coming up in 2024. And uh, that's the parks. Uh, today they had their movies announcements, and uh, they added stuff like um, the big thing they announced today was a 100 film Disney Legacy animated films collection, which is a really cool looking set. Which has um, what it basically is is that you have 100 animated films from Disney. Walt Disney Animation Studios and Pixar are all packaged together in hardbound, self-standing three-volume sets that unfold into a storybook. And uh, there will only be a limited number of these sets, which will be available for pre-order on Walmart beginning September 18th, which includes each includes a certificate of authenticity, and the sets will be released on November 14th. The sets include 100 animated titles on Blu-ray, digital codes for each title featuring the original theatrical poster, a lithograph from Disney's new movie Wish, and a collectible Crystal Mickey Ears hat with Disney 100 exclusive engraving. And uh, you get a lot of movies on here. You get the Disney classics, of course, but then you get stuff like a Goofy movie. You get stuff like uh, uh, the Pig, Poo, uh, the Tigger movie, Pooh's Big, uh, Piglet's Big movie, Pooh's Heffle Up movie. Just a mix of all the different Disney animated films, from like the classics to the Pixar films to the newer films. It's a really cool looking set. Fifteen hundred dollars, I think they said the asking price was for. So uh, that's really, really steep. I don't really think I'd want to spend all that money. If it's actually much cheaper than they're letting you on, I'll see if I, I would definitely see if I can try to get it like when the pre-orders come out next week. So that's something I'm definitely going to keep an eye on. Uh, they revealed some new details about the new Disney short, Once Upon a Studio, which is going to be a celebration of an all-star ensemble of classic Disney characters from the past 100 years. It's going to be a film that's going to be in front of Wish, but if you live in California, you'll be able to see it at the El Capitan Theater on September 15th. So it'll be there for a couple of weeks. They have yet to put out a trailer for Wish yet, the new trailer, which I, th I assume is going to be coming out really soon, since we're about over two months away from getting into the release of the film, so I'm, I'm really curious to when they're going to put the trailer out for that. Um, what else do we have here? Looking here to see if there's anything else. Noteworthiness. Uh, well, like I said, the last thing they mentioned was the D23 will be August 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, they'll have a, an event at the Anaheim Convention Center, there'll be a kickoff on, the, on August 8th, and then there'll be a D23 day at Angel Stadium where the D23 fans will be invited to attend the Los Angeles Angels at the New York Mets game on Sunday, August the 4th. Uh, that'll be before the D23 event, but um, I'll be really curious to see what happens with the D23 event next year. I'm really excited to see what they'll bring to the table there. Um, not really a whole lot new to be excited about with this, but... Um, some things that could be very interesting going down the road. So I'm definitely very excited to see what they will, if any of these things that they have announced will be coming to fruition. This could be something that could be really exciting to see over the next couple of years. So, so that's the Destination D23 stuff here. Uh, let's go ahead and get to get towards the finish line here. Let's talk about some recommendations for this week. So I have a streaming recommendation, and it's a show that just came out in the last couple of days. It's a uh, Tiny Toons Luniversity on Max. Or uh, it's on Cartoon Network every Saturday morning if you don't have Max. Um, I do have Max. I have been watching only a couple of episodes, though. I really like it so far. It's a reboot of the Tiny Toons series from the 90s that follows the characters into the college years at Alex at uh, Alex Acme University. And uh, they actually have a college campus on, this, on here. So you have Buster, uh, Hampton, and Plucky in one fraternity. And then you have uh, Babs and Sweetie Pie and Shirley... And uh, the girl, the girl characters, the Tiny Toons in the in the sorority, and of course the, the big the big focus on that everybody's been focusing on is the fact that Buster and Babs are no longer boyfriend girlfriend; they're actually brother and sister now. And there has been a lot of mixed opinions on that. I like what the, it's, I actually don't mind it because it is a different it's a different take on the Tiny Toons. It's not meant to be taken in the same in the same chronicle. It's not meant to take place in the same universe as the original series. So, and if they, and like I said, if you do it well enough, you can but you can change things around and not have it be a problem if you do your job well. And I think they do a pretty good job so far. They actually have a good voice cast doing a pretty good job with these voices here. Eric Bauza, very good talented voice actor playing Buster Buddy. He also plays Bugs in this. And many of the characters from the Looney Tunes cartoons reprise their roles in this show. You also have uh, Ashley Crate Crystal Hairston. 
as Mab's buddy. Uh, David Arago Jr. as Plucky and Hampton. Tessa Netti as Sweetie. These are all really good voice actors, and they're all doing a f pretty good job with these roles here. And uh, the comedy overall is very good. The animation overall is very solid. It is a still a very good... It's a still pretty entertaining show. And uh, I've only seen a couple of episodes. I've really liked what I've seen so far. And um, I'm going to like it so far. I think it's done by a lot of the same people who did Animaniacs. The Animaniacs reboot on Hulu, too. Because I think I've seen some names on there that are very familiar. But I do like that they're not only bringing in the classic characters, but they're also bringing in the obscure Warner Brothers characters. Like, there's an episode where... Buster goes to meet his mentor, and it's this and it's this mouse character named um, Merlin the Magic Mouse, which is the character that you might know of if you never saw the Warner Brothers Seven Arts era of cartoons. And um, there's a lot of obscure characters in here. I think Cool Cat shows up in the show at some point. They bring in Lola from Space Jam in here, who's not played by Cass Susie, nor she played by Kristen Wiig or Zendaya, but I think it's uh, Kari Walgren who does the voice of um, who's done a lot of voices on the Looney Tunes cartoons. So. It is nice that they're branching out to different eras of different Looney Tunes characters for this show. The show's been pretty good so far. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Tiny Toons University. It's available to stream now on uh, Max, but it's also going to be on Cartoon Network every Saturday morning. I think it's on every day, every afternoon, I think around noon, as far as I saw from the TV listings. But um, definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. It's definitely worth the watch. So um, that's one of my recommendations for this week. And in continuation with Warner Brothers Animation and Recommendations, this week on Blu-ray, and for, especially on, but most importantly on 4K, Batman Mask of the Phantasm comes out. And uh, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I mean, this is a film that came out in 1993. It came out just after Batman the Animated Series came out. Uh, it was originally intended to be a direct video release, but they put it in theaters. They pretty much dumped it on Christmas Day in 1993. Nobody went to go see it. But it has garnered a cult following over the years, so much so that it's got the, it's getting a 4K transfer. And what more do I need to say about this movie that hasn't already been said? It's a phenomenal movie, a very good Batman anime film, a very good animated movie in general, a great mystery and all. It's just a really fantastic film that definitely deserves a lot more, definitely deserves to get the best kind of treatment possible. I already pre-ordered this. I can't wait for it to come in here. If you can find it in the stores, get it on 4K. You will not be disappointed by it. It's got to look amazing. Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Definitely look for that one. Those are my recommendations for the week. So with that said, uh, that's going to wrap this show up. Uh, I can't believe I actually made it. Uh, but um, but uh, that's how life works, I guess. I mean, it's been a really... It's been a really rough week. I know that I've been delayed on several different things I had planned for this and the other channel as well as the other side as well. But um, it's just, you know, life just has a way of working so, working like that sometimes. So um, hopefully next week things will get back on track. But I um, wanted to get this out here tonight. So, um, uh, yeah, with that said, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you like what you heard here, uh, check out some of the other episodes I've done. If you like this, hit the like and subscribe button. Also check out our other channel as well. And uh, I'll see you guys next week for another video. So um, uh, thank you guys for watching this, uh, listening to this as well. And uh, I'll see you guys next week for the next episode. So until then, we are out.